Welcome back and many thanks for staying with us on the number one breakfast show in the country, Morning at NTV. The coronavirus pandemic is still pretty much rearing its very, very ugly head. We do know that 71,543 people are grappling with COVID-19 in this jurisdiction of ours. And we also do have a 42-day lockdown total lockdown that is in its third day. Patients with chronic conditions and other ailments like COVID-19 are battling for access to health care and they are wondering how they get that essential medicine and are looking, looking left, right and center. Now to expand more on this conversation, I'm now joined by Chris Lucolio, the, the, the digital country lead at the United Nations Capital Development Fund. We also do have Elena. Yes, Elena Kembabazi. She is a program manager right to health at the Initiative for Socio and Economic Rights. I'm also seeing Dr. Sesang Arthur. He is the director of medical services at the International Medical Center. We also joined from Democratic Republic of Congo by uh, Dr. Ofi Tamba, a public practitioner in the DRC. Now, gentlemen and lady, welcome to Morning at NTV. Thank you, Romeo. It's good to be here. Indeed. Quite amazing. Um, let's kick off with Dr. Arthur Sensanga, uh, the Director of Medical Services at the IMC. Dr. Arthur Sensanga, you run a chain of clinics that are, you know, spread all over the country. And I do know that uh, your patients are clamoring uh, for your services. How are you reaching them? Morning, Collins. Uh, Romeo. At, interna at, at international medical centers, we want to offer digital health solutions to mm. the clients who are stuck, especially in the lockdown. Indeed. We are currently uh, attempting to, as much as possible, get to each and everyone who needs health care. Uh, the international medical centers are spread throughout the country, and we started the digital uh, health solutions uh, to access drugs uh, uh, our clients through the telehealth um, solutions that we developed. So with the guidance of uh, IT systems and also partnership with MTN, we've uh, made it available to everyone wherever they are. So wherever uh, someone is, they can uh, call into the IMCs and get their drugs delivered. But also we have, uh, because our medical writers are, are clinically trained, okay? So they can be able to get to each individual person, take your blood pressure, if you need a blood sugar to be done, if you're uh, diabetic, you, that can be done. Uh, if you're hypertensive, it has a blood uh, uh, a sleep, sleep or what is called a blood pressure machine. So your blood pressure will be taken. So the medical rider will be able to uh, give you uh, ample service. If a doctor is needed on the other side, then the doctor will be called and then a further discussion will be held. Uh, now, in the current lockdown, and especially with uh, COVID, the pandemic, we also, that medical rider is uh, properly trained to be able to take off a sample. They've got all the gadget, the wear, and they take all the precautions that is necessary. So they can equally be able to take off your sample from your home, from your office, from wherever you are, uh, and they, you get your results online. So we've come, uh, the digital health uh, solutions have helped us so that we can do treatment from the confines of your home, confines of your office where is possible and everywhere that you are. Now we access even remote places because as I said, we are spread throughout the country all around in Arua, Gulu, Soroti and Bale, even in Barara. So we can access the remote areas and the doctor can get to you and you can get first class services uh, through the digital health. Collins? Well, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Arthur Sesanga. He is the Director of Medical Services at the International Medical Center. And it's from you, sir. Uh, let's also bring in Alana Kembabuzi. She is the Program Manager, Right to Health at the Initiative for Socio and Economic Rights. Um, Alana Kembabuzi, you and I know very well that this second lockdown appears to be unplanned and very haphazard in that regard. So I would like to know, because you lead and research into health rights at the Initiative for Socio and Economic Rights. So... Talk to us about the impact of the first lockdown. How bad was it, Elana, as we speak? And uh, what do we have in store or waiting for us in the second lockdown? Yeah, it's unfortunate that we do have to be in a second lockdown because of the cases and deaths. So on the one hand, I understand government there, but the impact of these lockdowns is devastating, not just on incomes, but a lot of time on continuity uh, of healthcare. 
the last lockdown, we had patients, for example, cancer patients, just failing to get healthcare for months, missing treatments. Uh, we had HIV patients missing refills uh, and others who, who need regular refills. We had pregnant women that died trying to get to a facility. Um, and so there's a lot of um, importance in ensuring that there's continuity of uh, healthcare because you know your disease does not, does not pause because there's a lockdown. You still get the medical emergencies. You still need the access to drugs. Um, and I think that that for me stems from the ways in which we have failed to make our health system deliver the way it should. Our policies are clear about having to have a, a health facility within five kilometers. But somehow we find it very okay to have districts, entire districts that don't have district hospitals, uh, sub counties that do not have uh, health health centers. But also we've decided we are going to, for example, centralize the treatment of cancer care uh, for you know for those who have to rely on government facilities only, particularly such that you only have to come to the Uganda Cancer Institute. Remember last year, the Cancer Institute was stuck with people. Some of them had come here, and then they had to feed them because they could not go back and those who are there could not come across. And in this lockdown, because remember that as much as we're now on like day two or 42, we started, we, we had to do a reset. But even in the earlier, like the last two weeks, districts have been closed. And so earlier on last week, we were asking the president, how are people moving to get healthcare, to get medicines to their loved ones? We saw people reaching out to digital solutions, but those are people who have means would well, say, okay, I'll call Rocket Health or I'll call uh, this pharmacy um, or if I am in Kampala, I can call uh, IHK right now, whatever. But um, again, you're dealing with only a particular class of people. So given the right to health, it's a health, I keep saying, is a right. And so it should be a privilege that only a few have. I think it's very important that we think about continuity of care. Now, the government this year has said, if you have a medical uh, you can either go to the medical facility and get a referral or get an LC1 letter. Some people argue that that is still, it's a bit better than last year because last year you had to get an RDC. Some of us didn't even know our RDC, they didn't even ask for money. But um, it's still not as, as seamless. And again, even if you go to all these things, you have to find a way to transport yourself. Um, and so we need to be thinking, how do we bring health services closer to people? I don't know that I would at this point say, for example, that government should be able to have sort of the digital, you know, sort of the riders that go out. Uh, although I guess if you look us down, maybe you should have had a plan because you had years to build facilities closer to us and you did not. So if you're going to look us down, you should be exploring all kinds of options to get healthcare closer. But I think the fact that um, I, when IHK and others talk about these options, my first thought is the people I've met, the women just trying to get their cancer or HIV treatment and how they are left out of this system. So for me, it's just a real call to have improved access to healthcare and for government to invest in making sure government facilities do have them. Because uh, again, they serve the poor and the majority of us because a lot of us just won't be able to afford some of these options. But also just to add that with digital health, the other bit about it that I think is relevant, the discussion happening right now, is just being able to have data right? Where are people and, and how do you interact with them? And I think that's super important uh, right now. So it's something that the government can emulate from the digital health sphere, just being able to figure out, you know, this is where someone is. Because right now you only know people who come to your health facilities. So sometimes you're not very sure what the impact of certain things will be. But now if you have data, particularly from private providers, if they share that data, which they should, about where the people are, it would be useful for planning purposes in the future. The onset of the first pandemic and uh, the lockdown that was in March of 2020, we did see so many pregnant mothers die on their way to the hospitals at the hands of police officers or security members who did not or, or who couldn't prioritize that maybe person X and need some kind of help, even though they do not have clearance from the LC1 chairperson. So even the same, last week I was moving through uh, the curfew hours uh, with some police officers in Nansen, Ghana, trying to work with them and ascertain whether or not our people were adhering to the uh, SOP then I met a mother. She was actually pregnant and she was telling me how police officers had roughed her up, yet she was trying to access a medical uh, center within that jurisdiction. Do you have such a situation during this new 42-day total lockdown where uh, people in her situation are actually going to be succumbing over the uh, implementation of the SOPs? Mm. 
Absolutely. And even, um, I think some of these providers, mm. like say Arthur was you know, sending some of his health workers, I think in the beginning, it was not even clear if they could ride, right? Mm. Um, this year it's a bit better, but I think last year was really haphazard. Mm. Because if you're not supposed to be having a bike and some, it was just all very unclear. Mm. We've also received reports that even this year, that for example, health workers are struggling to get to health facilities because initially they say move with your ID so forth. Then at some point there's a health worker I think who was on a border and they said no, the health worker can move. You're not supposed to carry her. And she's like, how do I get there? So people have been sending in reports of health workers that walked like two or whatever hours to get the facility, they're exhausted and they have to figure out how to get home. They're thinking, what is in it for me to sacrifice myself to this extent? But I think for me, a more sustainable solution, generally, is to bring these health services closer to the people. Indeed. Make sure the health facilities mm -hmm. are, are, are built closer and then begin, then you can have the conversation of, can people walk, mm. can, otherwise, it is all, it's, we cannot continue like this. You can't, people otherwise are going to have to beg, Arthur, please, can you get me? I don't even know how. If I'm a cancer patient right now, Arthur, in Amdat, how do you help me? Tell me. Great like, insights by that? Elena Kembabazi. Great yeah. insights by Elena Kembabazi. Thank you very much. She is a program manager, Right to Health, at the Initiative for Socio and Economic Rights. I also have a Dr. Arthur Sesanga. He is the Director of Medical Services at the IMC. We also do have a Dr. Ofi Tamba. He is a, a public health practitioner from the DRC. And also Chris Lokolio, the Digital Country Lead at the United Nations Capital Development Fund. But before I go to you, Chris, let's, go, uh, let's get a picture of what is happening within the DRC. Dr. Ofi Tamba, talk to us and paint for us a picture of of how the COVID-19 pandemic is wreaking havoc within the DRC. Good morning, sir. And of course, you're talking about DRC that has a total of 37,808 cases of COVID-19. We wanted to have the public health practitioner, Dr. Ofi, paint for us a picture of what is happening in terms of COVID-19. There you are. Very good morning, sir. Acquaintance. Uh, good morning. Thank you so much for uh, inviting uh, me to this uh, great uh, panel to talk about the situation of COVID in uh, my country, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, currently, we are, I would say, uh, for a couple of weeks now, we are in um, the second, uh, the third wave of the pandemic. The um, government has uh, made some decision to make sure that we can uh, deal with the, this uh, third, third uh, wave. We um, have around now uh, 400 cases per day. And uh, the, for the entire country, and the Kinshasa is still, is still the, the, the Kinshasa, which is the capital city of the Democratic Republic of, of Congo, is still the epicenter of that uh, of uh, this uh, third uh, wave. But we have not, uh, we are not in lockdown. We are not in lockdown. Uh, there are some measures, uh, uh, some uh, measures like uh, people have to wear masks in public. There are uh, gathering. Gatherings of people of more than 20 people are not allowed. Uh, churches are still open, but uh, restaurants, bars, and nightclubs are, are, are closed now. And um, school and university are still open. So we are not in lockdown, but yeah, the situation is a bit worse than uh, what it was, um, I would say, a month ago. Yeah. What about access to medicine and other health services for the many people within the DRC? Are citizens still flocking these health centers physically, or is there a strategy to actually embark on telehealth or telemedicine? No, so far, they can still uh, get access uh, physically to the health facilities since we are not in lockdown, as I said. So mm. people can still see the doctors and they can uh, get the medication. And for the patient who need a referral, they can still go and uh, take the medication as uh, usual. But yeah, the capacity in hospital is very limited li limited now. So mm -hmm. yeah, because there are some measures that have been put in place. So the situation is not as, I would say, as normal, but yes, people can still meet their, their, their doctors. They can see, still access to the pharmacist and, and so on. They can move, uh, they can go to work. The capacity, for example, I would say the number of uh, people who can go to work has been reduced to uh, a maximum of 50% for most of the companies, even for in uh, government, uh, in, the, in our government uh, settings. But life, life is still like a little bit as uh, normal, I would say. So people can still get access to the uh, uh, to the to the health facility, Indeed. and I would say, yeah. 
Dr. Afitamba, this is what my people in Uganda are grappling to understand. You're in a third wave and you're only having 37,808 cases of COVID-19. We are in a second wave and we are grappling with 70,000, 71. 1,543 cases of COVID-19. Uh, we, we do not, uh, we are trying to make those additions to understand what is happening within the DRC. It means in a third way, you could be having more cases than what meets the eye because your president, Felix Shisekedi, he came in last month and he said, we are overwhelmed by COVID-19. So is that a commitment that we are going to see a rigorous campaign on the ground with, from the government trying to curtail uh, the COVID-19 pandemic? But largely, that's not what we are seeing. Life is largely back to normal. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I would say the situation you're representing is, is, is correct. If I got you, mm. I, I got you right. You yes. are, we are still in the in the. Uh, yeah, I say we are in the in the third uh, wave. But uh, if I should think as a government, I think there are some there are some level of measure that you can put in place. And for the DRC currently, if they decide to lock down, it's going to be a bit a disaster in this situation now, because the country is not prepared to, uh, for example, to uh, deliver uh, digital uh, care and like to uh, organize the, the our, our, I would say our health system is still uh, uh, paper-based. Paper the system is paper-based, the infrastructure are not there. So I, would, I, would, I think that it's going to hurt more if the government decide now to lock people down and decide not to let people have access to their doctor than if it's the, we are in this, in this situation. That's why I think that the government is a bit trying to manage with those measures they have taken because our country is not prepared to be uh, locked down. It's, it's a reality. Maybe we'll get there if the situation is get, get, uh, gets uh, worse and worse. But honestly, the country is not prepared. And uh, yes, we, we are still seeing what the government is going to do. But no, we, 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 I would say it's going to hurt more the people if the, they decide to, to do the lockdown, uh, to, to, to lock the country down uh, uh, now. Wait, I have a quick question. Uh, before so, I let so, you go, I before I let you go, just to, just to ask him, because he says something very critical. He says that. Yeah, yeah I'm going to, I'm going to let you expand more on. I'm going to let you expand more on that, but uh, I wanted him to paint for us a picture of what is happening within the DRC, especially with the uh, people of uh, DRC who are escaping the volcano, Nira, uh, Nirangongo volcano. We do know that that exacerbated the number of people who are on the streets. Yes, we'd like to know, don't you think that led to an increase in COVID-19 cases, Dr. Ofi? The fact that people are running away from Nirangongo a volcano. Yeah, that's a possibility. They are mm -hmm. monitoring the... the, the the situation over there that's a possibility that the cases number of cases can increase over there i don't know if i got your question when but mm -hmm. that's a possibility and uh, yeah they have taken some measures over there specifically specifically for that region uh, as well but yeah it's it's obvious that people are uh, exposed to be contaminated or infected to covid uh, 19. Then, th thankfully uh, goma is, is not many cases as in, in kinshasa but yeah, there is that risk and uh, yeah, it, it is monitored now. The government is monitoring that situation very closely, but there is a thing that the, the number of cases over there can increase quickly. Public health practitioner from the DRC, let's also bring in the digital country lead at the United Nations, Devo uh, United Nations Capital Development Fund, that is Mr. Chris Lucolio. Mr. Chris Lucolio, you have supported Uganda's digital transformation, courtesy of the United Nations Capital Development Fund, for a while now. would like to know, would you say that we are in a place or position where uh, digital technologies can support end-to-end -end health service delivery? Thank you so much for having me. Um, Indeed, uh, the UN Capital Development Fund is um, implementing a program in Uganda focused on leaving no one behind in the digital era. And I would say that um, I think that even though this is a time of tragedy, it's a pretty trying time. I also think that it's also a time to see opportunity. Uh, I think that um, Alana mentioned that there are lots of policies in place. Um, I think that the government has been, uh, if you look at uh, other governments across, uh, across the globe, this has been one of the governments that has really embraced um, digital transformation. Uh, if you look at the National Development Plan, it's a very central piece. And so I think that there are opportunities. Um, luckily, in the healthcare sector here, 
if you look at rural areas, and we work very much in, in rural areas where there are those communities that are in danger of being left behind in this digital era, you'll find that healthcare is primarily delivered through community health workers. Uh, in Uganda, we call them village health teams. And so even though a health center might be far, there are community members who are conducting uh, assessments door to door, uh, whether it's uh, prenatal, postnatal care, HIV, malaria. And so there is an opportunity. And I think that um, if we talk about you know, is Uganda ready to harness technology to deliver healthcare? I think it is, you know, through these village health teams, and we are working with several partners um, like BRAC, you know, you have several people like Living Goods, and the Ministry of Health is very strong in leveraging these village health teams um, and now empowering them with technology. So somebody comes to a doorstep with a mobile device and is able to ask, is there a pregnant woman here? Um, when was her last, uh, when was her last checkup? Uh, what medication is she on? And can make those referrals. And I think that that's an opportunity. And so I think that what we've seen uh, as this pandemic has raged on is a greater appreciation for the role that technology can play in the delivery of healthcare. And now with our health system, having those community health workers as primary health care providers in these rural areas, I think is a big opportunity. So um, as we build, uh, I should mention that UNCDF in implementing this program focuses on uh, working with policymakers to ensure that policies in place are conducive for people to take on and use digital technologies for their health care and well-being. But also we work to uh, foster inclusive innovation, that innovations that are put in place are considerate of those rural communities that are otherwise in danger of being left behind. We also try to build digital literacy. And, and this is where, again, I see an opportunity that, yes, as we take on bigger projects, because this is a huge pandemic, the entire globe has been affected. There's so much that is unknown. So indeed, uh, there will be challenges in delivery. But you have these community health workers who, in many cases, now all of us have access to phones, many of us have access to phones, even simple phones, that as we build digital literacy, as we try to improve the ability of different community members to use these devices, there's opportunity to share information, to have assessments at these doorsteps, to deliver information, and the SOPs can be better adhered to as we leverage technology. So to answer your question, I believe we are uniquely positioned. And I think that we should um, harness this opportunity, frankly. There was a time when technology in healthcare and education was seen as this, you know, nice to have a good thing for uh, Western countries. And now we see it as a necessity. And, and indeed, technology is not an end in and of itself. It's a means to an end. And I believe that we have the window here as we try to survive this pandemic to harness technology to make sure that no Ugandan is left behind. Thank you. Mr. Chris Lukolio is the digital country lead at the United Nations Capital Development Fund. Thank you very much, sir, for that great, great insight. Let's also bring in Dr. Arthur Sesanga, the Director of Medical Services at the International Medical Center. Um, Arthur, how have you overcome questions around credibility and trust issues that come with technology? As a person, how do I convince myself or how can you convince me that a voice behind the other side that I can't see is telling the truth, Arthur? <laughs> How do you convince me that the voice on the other side is telling me the truth, that I can't look in the eye? Romy, I didn't, I didn't get you very uh, well. We are talking about questions that might come around on uh, credibility when it comes to technology. How do you convince a citizen that uh, the voice that they can't see on the other side of the phone is telling them the truth? Okay, okay that they can't see the person. Go ahead, Arthur. Arthur, your sound has gone off. All right, we are talking about adapting digital technologies to the new health care demands. I have Elena Kembabasi, the Program Manager, Right to Health at the Initiative for Social and Economic Rights. We also have Dr. Arthur Sisanga, the Director 
of Medical Services at the IMC. Also, Chris Lucolio, the Digital Country Lead at the United Nations Capital Development Fair. And also from the DRC, Dr. Ofi Tamba, who is also joining us in that regard. Let me also bring in another of our guests. Um, that is uh, Mr. D that is Dr. Ofi Tamba. What does... Uh, Dr. Ofi Tamba, did we learn anything from the COVID-19, from the fight against Ebola? When it comes to fighting this pandemic... Repeat? Mm. Can you repeat the question, please? Did we learn anything from the fight against Ebola as we are using these lessons to fight this COVID-19 pandemic? Yes, there are some uh, lessons that we have uh, we have um, we 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 have learned from uh, uh, Ebola, especially about the communication mm. about the communication because uh, there was a similar issue uh, communication-wise when they are trying to implement uh, a vaccination activ activities against uh, Ebola. I think we have learned that lesson, those lessons, but we are not using them well so far. So that's what I can say. It's the first thing that we, we, we learned. The second thing we learned from the uh, Ebola uh, outbreak uh, or the, 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 the several Ebola outbreaks we have uh, already had in our country uh, I think those uh, outbreaks has revealed some of the weaknesses of our health system that should, we should be working uh, on. And I would say the, the, the third uh, thing or third lesson we have learned from the, the Ebola outbreak, outbreak, uh, outbreaks we have had in Congo is that uh, I, I would say that we should be prepared, like we should have like emergency preparedness uh, plans uh, for the country. And uh, also, yeah, that's pretty much the true lesson I can say from the top of my head now. But yeah, I think the communication issue is the biggest one. We have learned from e Ebola, but we have not used that uh, uh, lesson or used the conclusion what we have learned from uh, the miscommunication during the Ebola outbreak, the last or the two last uh, outbreaks in uh, uh, Congo. And we should know, we should work a little bit more on uh, that for the uh, current pandemic. But we did see people embracing Ebola vaccines. But during this COVID-19 fight, people are hesitant to embrace these COVID-19 vaccines. That could be the difference between the Ebola fight and this COVID-19 pandemic. Elena Kimbabazi, let's uh, talk about uh, the fact that uh, this conversation comes amidst uh, service shortages to the extent that private citizens are installing oxygen tanks within their homes to support relatives who are ailing with COVID-19 uh, disease. How did we come to this situation, Elena Kimbabazi? How bad is it? And do you think as an activist, we slept on the job? Elena. Yes, um, I, I, and I think Romeo, what you also raised mm. is, is a critical issue here. Where and I, I, it's a question I asked earlier to the DRC that it mm. seems like the um, maybe their health systems. I don't know. Yeah. From what uh, uh, Tamba was saying, it seems like their health systems are still not overwhelmed. In Uganda, they are, mm. and that's a shame because we had one year to get this together, and we should have prepared for this we got the resources actually and the time yeah. so there was a real faith on that end yeah but now that we're also here we are seeing that um again there's a whole lot of just profiteering price gorging forgetting we're in a pandemic which which we are um and so seeing that you know the cost of oxygen and the basics have been so astronomical even in private facilities that are not necessarily uh that sometimes going to get, for example, oxygen for free from, from roofings, right? It shows, again, a lack of regulation of actors in this space. So even as we think about how to, uh, as we think about digital technology and the potential it does have for the private sector, uh, for, for the Ugandans, right? There has to be a regulation of the actors in this space, including the private sector. Um, I think it can be a, a valuable source of data so that you sort of know who is where in the community. So if you, if you know that, for example, in, um, in Arua, there's an oxygen shortage, you have a sense of how many maybe active users or so forth, technology. But I think we, we do have to, again, make sure that any actor in this space uh, is not treating this as just a normal business. Healthcare is also a human right and access to it is. And with digital technology, <coughs> issues around privacy of the patient's data are also very, very important in how you handle that. Um, and so I think that there's a lot that we can reflect on from this moment. 
one around government preparedness around um not just pandemics, just the way in which we treat our health system. Can we get it together and finally fund and fix the public health system? Um, that would mean including having money and making it more accessible. It would mean that we have data and are using digital tools to make sure we have data on where our patients are. Um, and also regulating every actor in the space. They can complement government, but it cannot be business as usual. Um, and as the, the, the other thing that I would say, the question I guess I've, I've said at the beginning for everyone else is, you know, as you talk about all things, for example, um, Chris was talking about, you know, like a BRAC project, I think, that has these mobile tools and so forth for living goods. We need to make sure that these things are part of the public health system. They cannot just be projects that come and go. If you're really trying to make sure that we are strengthening our health systems, they have to be part of the public health system. The lessons learned must be there. And at some point, you take the trading wheels off. Government should learn to be able to say, okay, we have integrated this and we go. Such that um, we're not dependent entirely on, on well, you know, people who are partners who are trying to do good, um, either whether they're not for profit or maybe in private sector. We don't want to have a system where we build our entire foundation on it. These other actors can come in and, and complement. But what, what Ebola showed us mm. was we must have the government really running the show when it comes to healthcare and getting serious about it, being able to centralize its response in some instances, um, being able to plan for its people, being able to make sure, okay, we have enough beds, we have enough oxygen. If there's a surge here, we know that there are a lot more pregnant people here. So therefore, if we do institute lockdowns, we already yeah. have that data and, and, and can easily say these people here are exempt. So that planning will require, yes, digital tools, but above all, it requires political commitment. Mm. And that for me is very concerning because right now I don't know that I see it yet mm. sufficiently. And when it comes to regulation, I had Dr. Twine yesterday speak and say, oh, the law does not allow us to, actually our law does, and our law is very clear that protecting the right to life is fundamental mm. in this country, right from the constitution. We, it also we, ensures uh, access to mm. um, medicines and healthcare. So we have mm. to be able to think through how other actors All right. and other technology go by the way. All right, Alana. Mm. With the number of COVID-19 cases corrugating to 71,543, this conversation couldn't have come at the right time. Adapting technologies uh, to the healthcare demands that we are grappling right with right now with the onset of the second uh, total lockdown, 42 door lock uh, lockdown, which is in third day. I have Elena Kembawasi, Chris Lukolio. I also have Dr. Arthur Sesanga and also Dr. Ofi Tamba, with whom I shall expand more on this conversation shortly after these messages. Keep it here on Morning at NTV. You might be checked anytime soon. So please take advantage of the item of product. They are so beautiful. They enhance that relationship between you and that fine lady. I'm really talking the truth. Right here, I do have Arthur Sesanga. Dr. Arthur Sesanga is the Director of Medical Services at the International Medical Center. He's not alone. We also do have Alana Kembabasi. She is the Program Manager, Right to Health, at the Initiative for Socio and Economic Rights. We also have someone from the Democratic Republic of Congo, a public health practitioner, and that's none other than Dr. Ofi Tamba. And last but not least, we have Dr. Chris Lukolio. He is the um, Digital Country Lead at the United Nations Capital Development Fund. Three gentlemen and that lady are still are with me via Zoom, and many thanks for staying with us right here on Morning at NTV. Let me come to you, Dr. Arthur Sesang. Let's, let's talk about issues of credibility and trust issues when it comes to using technology. As a citizen of this country, how do you convince me that uh, I could trust a voice that I'm not seeing? Expand more on that. Issues of credibility. Thank you, Romeo, and I hope I'm clearer now. Yes, the, you are. Uh, technology, uh, indeed, it's it's a big challenge, especially for uh, clientele who might not have used, for example, Zoom links or even a, a video on WhatsApp. It's a tough one. But the telemedicine uh, initiation that we have so far has what we call the teleappropriate and inappropriate conditions. There are things you'll not be able to handle on um, on, on on the telehealth platform. 
And so there's what we call a triage. When you call in our uh, free uh, number, you'll be able to be triaged and see whether you're appropriate for this uh, session. And then uh, the doctor will go ahead, then it will be forwarded to the doctor, and then uh, they will uh, deal with your condition if it's uh, found appropriate. Now, it's, uh, it's, it's a bit difficult, it's a bit novel, and uh, some people may not appreciate it that much. But interestingly, for uh, not only in COVID, but especially COVID clients that we've managed using the telehealth medicine, it's been quite uh, a good experience, and they, they've had very good outcomes even on that uh, telehealth platform. Now, the other thing to note, even for communities where it's remote, like Alana alluded to, I don't have a smartphone, I can't, uh, we, and that's where, like Chris shared, we need the public-private partnerships so that we enhance, uh, harness this product because a medical rider could get to this uh, locality and then they'll be able to, because our medical rider, for example, has um, a smartphone. So they'll be able to link in and then on the other side is the doctor. And they will be able, the person will be able to see the past, uh, the actual clinicians who, who working on them. They can share a few uh, things and then the medical writer, as I said, is a medically trained personnel. We continue with the things that need uh, physically to be done, like taking the blood pressure, doing your uh, oxygen saturation or the box oximeter and anything else of taking your blood sugar. And then the doctor on the other side will recommend what medication you you can uh, be placed on or adjusting your doses. It's the same thing even with the COVID. If the medical rider has gone and taken off a sample, and if we're doing the rapid test, then uh, we can get the readings within 15 minutes. So someone can quickly decide on what will be taken. And remember, he goes with the pack. We have a home care pack. So that can be uh, provided immediately to the person in need. So all that is uh, something, it's, it's still new. Some people have not uh, gotten used to it, but we are, uh, we are gaining mileage. And if we do that public-private uh, partnership, Alana, it should be, I think this is an opportunity for us to partner with government. And since we already know how it's run, we've all already tested it, we've gone out in the countryside. I've treated people as far as Busia on that telehealth uh, project. And they've, they've had very good outcomes. So someone goes, picks their sample, brings it back to the lab and they, it can be run. So I think in times like this, this is the opportunity for us to partner. Remember, we are only partners with government. We do not, all the patients we treat are for the government of Uganda. And so this is, we're just helping to ease the management of healthcare in the country. So if only we can strengthen and harness these uh, partnerships, then I see a very uh, great stride in how we can uh, achieve this. So even those cancer patients, Alana, that you're worried about should be rich, should be uh, managed, even when lockdown is biting so hard for everyone. So for me, it's a great opportunity for all of us to work together. Uh, we've tried it, we've seen it, but of course it's limited by the fact that we've not reached out to everyone. But when we uh, get into the government too, I think we'll reach the whole country. It's an opportunity for us. Thank you, Romeo. Uh, uh, Mr. Sesanga, do you envisage a situation or do you see any business hits in terms of a drop in business as we grapple with this 42-day lockdown? The drop in business, do you hmm. mean? Yes. Okay. In, 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 in earnest, yes, of course, because of the lockdown, access mm. to healthcare facilities drops, and as such, mm. uh, people resort to self-medication, mm. treating their, uh, themselves at home, and you've seen everything that's going on on social media, especially not only but for COVID. So as such, people are not seeking medical care. Again, as a, a, a healthcare practitioner, I've been in practice, I've practiced both in government and uh, the private, my passion is to see everyone get care. Our passion is not necessarily only to drive business. I have to admit that we've got to uh, have uh, funds to pay the workers, that one I can't deny. But again, we want to reach out to everyone. Currently, we offer HIV treatment on the free package of uh, government. So we purely uh, give out the drugs without uh, costing it to anyone. So we still feel that in as much as business will draw, the people need the care. We need the healthy population. 
because that's what the whole country needs for the economy to thrive. So in as much as business might drop in health-wise, we can still use this opportunity to reach out to everyone and provide for them. And I wouldn't mind, I wouldn't shy away from partnering with government. And if they can, for example, provide that fuel for my bike and maybe a few, a, a bit of facilitation for the biker, those free services can be accessed even to the government uh, entity. So I think I'm not worried in terms of uh, thinking business will drop, no. Most importantly, we need a healthy population before we can think about Arthur Sensanga, the Director of Medical Services at the International Medical Centre. Let's also bring in the Digital Country Lead at the United Nations Capital Development Fund, Mr. Chris Lukolio. As um, highlighted by Mr. Uh, Sensanga, he says that people are not going to health centres physically, so our best option is adapting technologies to meet this demand. But how best can we ensure that we increase the capacity of, a di of our digital health startups uh, to meet that level of uh, brick and mortar health services? Thank you so much. Uh, I hope I caught your question well. Indeed. You're asking how to increase the capacity of our health centers to adopt technology, is that right? Digital health startups to meet the capacity of the brick and mortar health centers. Ah, okay. Mm. No, uh, thanks so much for your question. Um, indeed, it's a very good point that many times when you look at a healthcare system, um, you wonder how will it survive if there's no support from the outside. And I think uh, that's a very important point because um, at UNCDF and, and several other UN agencies, we are actually operating uh, a system called a market systems development approach. We are not, you know, the idea here is to pilot and scale innovations that are actually being undertaken by people within the market, that these individuals should be able to deliver these solutions even when, you know, development partners are not part of the equation. And so, indeed, we do see that there are several startups uh, that are eager to extend solutions. I mean, if I can, uh, somebody did mention <clears throat> Rocket Health. Uh, these are providers of, of, of telemedicine services. We also do see quite a lot of other startups that are looking at payment services to allow patients to pay for services, even when, you know, even when they might not have access to cash. So the idea is that if we're going to foster inclusive innovation, if we're going to make it possible for these startups to serve uh, a more distanced po population, I think that one, there has to be a, a, an enabling policy environment. And I should say, indeed, at least the government of Uganda does a good job in putting in place policies. We can have a, dis a debate about implementation of those policies, but the policies are in place, and we do see lots of innovation parks, we do see lots of um, subsidies on you know, technology equipment. So the idea is to create an enabling environment that innovators can actually create these solutions and benefit from them. The second is that we have worked closely with big players in the digital space. These are the people who provide the infrastructure on which these solutions might ride. And you might know of something called an API. This allows one program to talk to another. There are several institutions, I mean, mobile network operators, uh, banks and so on, who are opening up their APIs. That if I, as an innovator, have a good idea, I might be able to access certain APIs for free that allow me to extend services to rural communities. And so these are other initiatives that are allowing, um, that would allow startups to better innovate for rural communities. Last but not least, um, this concept of open data system that, you know, allowing one data, one database to talk to another. I mean, look at um, many cases. One example is the, the ID system, right? That if every time I have to access services, I need to show an ID, especially for services that might be free, maybe provided by government. Are there ways to leverage open data systems whereby the know your customer protocols, KYC protocols that are developed by say a mobile network operator when you access your SIM card, can those be now used by an innovator like Rocket Health, like others? And Dr. Sesanga was talking about, they provide HIV treatment that is free. If I need to show an ID, is there a way to make that I don't need to show a physical ID every time that there's a digital ID that can be captured and my services can be extended to me? And so these are some areas uh, where we are working, 
but again, in partnership with local counterparts, this is local ownership and local capability, because again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that there is an increased awareness and an increased appreciation for the role the technology can play in delivery of healthcare. And to your question, um, can we, how do we make sure that startups are more, more able? These are some of the steps, indeed, an enabling policy and regulatory environment, uh, working with private sector to open up some of the access to, those, uh, to that infrastructure that I talked about, but also ensuring that uh, I think we have also been talking about um, increased digital literacy. Uh, I think you raised a very good point about how does somebody know that the person on the other end is legitimate? And so increasing the awareness of our public uh, to know that, all right, these are the questions I ask. This is how I verify the information I receive. This is how I might verify the identity of the doctor on the other end. And so those are some aspects that would make um, the startups in our ecosystem better able to meet that demand, to meet that gap for uh, healthcare within, within this pandemic and indeed beyond. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much, Chris. Local, he is the digital country lead at the United Nations uh, Capital Development Fund. Let me also bring in Elena Kembawasi. She is the program manager, Right to Health, at the Initiative for Socio and Economic Rights. Elena, uh, during the onset of this pandemic, FSDU Uganda conducted a study that indicated that 1.8 million traders, these are mostly women, might not go to pre pandemic uh, economic activity levels that we saw before the onset, that is in 2019. Now, as we grow up over this 42, day lockdown that is in its third day. Do you envisage a situation whereby more women and other vulnerable groups fall more into poverty? We are talking about uh, agriculture that largely stayed open in 2020. Now we are talking about an inter-travel ban and so forth. Do you think the women who are largely within agriculture are going to be affected the most as we move forward? So Alana Kembabasi, yes, the back. impact of this um, pandemic. Yes. I want to, first of all, uh, one of the things you've mentioned is that it's very important, the biting economic effect of this pandemic on livelihoods. And those, that must be kept in mind as we talk about what government should be doing now and who can afford it. Arthur talked about, I, for Alana, don't really use your service for affordability reasons. And I'm a privileged person. I am quite privileged. Um, and so I hear some of this and I say to myself, is that where government should be putting its money? Because more than ever, we used to think that public health systems were just going to be for the poor. But more than ever, we are, we are all going to have to, because what COVID has shown is, today you may have a job posing with your insurance, you can call these guys, you can go there, and tomorrow you might not, in a, in a blink of an eye. And so we must make sure that we have strong foundations and basics. We are just talking on the call uh, during the break, and Tamba was telling us how in the DRC, you can get a, a rapid test for free in 10 minutes. You have your results. That is why their COVID response probably hasn't reached as crazy as ours. But right now, even with these digital tools they're talking about, after how much do you charge for you for us to get an RDT? And you're going to talk about, um, you know, government, government, if it puts some money in, in a public private partnership, it gives you fuel, all of that. This is a reality. We have had public private partnerships in this country with not for profit entities who let us look at the end users. We still find these services unaffordable. We still find that women, pregnant women who go to these facilities to give birth because government has invested there, saying the private sector will deliver, have been detained. Just in December, Isa had to run and rescue a 15-year-old girl that had been detained. She went there. There was no public alternative. She went to this PNFP, PPP, and there she was detained until we came in and intervened. So as we talk about where government should put its money, I want us to remember the people who we serve and where they are in terms of livelihoods in terms of the remoteness of where they are. I think government should use its existing systems. I like the idea that you have a community health worker, for example, they know their community, they know where these things are, they go there and they connect. But also government should be stepping up, putting in, making sure that these facilities are equipped. Let me tell you, you can only do so much with telemedicine. Is it important? Yes. But now say it's a pregnant mother. What you need, the telemedicine will come in as an intermediate intervention to know, do you really need to are you probably having labor right now or is it a contract? Or like, do you need to get the hospital right now to have that conversation? 
or, or if it's a cancer patient, a cancer patient, you still need to be able to examine. And I know this from having cancer, of taking cancer patients, where, yes, you may have pain in your bone. I'm going to have to see. I think any doctor actually worth their back. Okay. Uh, Lena Kembabazi, thank you very much for that humble submission. Let me also bring in Dr. Ofi Tamba from the DRC. Dr. Ofi, has the DRC adopted any technologies to keep delivering health care services during this COVID-19 pandemic? Dr. Ofi. Sorry? Has the DRC adopted any technologies to keep on delivering health care services during this pandemic? Yes, I, I would say yes, but not the government. Like uh, some uh, private uh, hospitals and organizations have implemented uh, digital health services, but at the government level, no. Uh, as I said, the things are still open, so they did not, uh, uh, they have not started to implement uh, such a uh, uh, initiative, but yeah, on the private healthcare uh, sector, yes, they are, they are doing that uh, already. And unfortunately, it's only for people who can afford to pay for those uh, 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 services. Because I think that there are some steps that you have to, to follow to, to reach to that uh, level. And those private hospitals and private organizations have already made those, uh, made those uh, uh, steps to implement uh, uh, such uh, initiative. But for our government, we have not yet implemented uh, uh, digital uh, healthcare uh, so far. In Dr. Arthur Sesanga, the Director of Medical Services at the IMC. Dr. Arthur, we also do know that the 12% tax on data is taking center stage or being activated on July 1st during the onset of the financial year 2021-2022. Don't you think that tax on the internet is going to have an effect on telehealth, on telemedicine, now that we are telling people to clamor for digital health services? Let's be honest. Uh, tough one, indeed, mm. Romeo, and uh, indeed it might affect the, the usage mm. of uh, the telehealth or even make it more expensive. It's difficult to tell how the uptake will be, but those are also discussions that someone can have and see how that can be enhanced. Again, I will not shy away from saying the, uh, the, the relation, the PPP, in as much as Alana feels they have not benefited the local person, I maybe to some extent, and I, I, I can't uh, blame the system is still uh, picking up. There's lots to be fixed, but also there are, there, are, there are things, for example, that the international medical centers under the international medical group has done to make sure we do, uh, we have the community social responsibility, CSR, uh, and we give out, if you look at as simple as Mark India. We are looking after uh, cases of HIV free, including clinical care without a coin paid from the, uh, from the guys who can't afford. Uh, so that is something that uh, we've taken out. In Soroti, before the lockdown, we plan to do the white stick distribution to people who are blind in Soroti. And that's again, another CSR arm that we've taken out and partnering with government. That's on our side, but we want to help the government to help out those people. So I feel we still have done a lot. There are many other CSR uh, activities we've done in Arua, in Gulu, and we will continue to do. I still feel in spite of the challenges that have been experienced in the PPPs, it's a great opportunity. Chris, for you, just for you, is that we need to partner and make this work. We need to make this roll out. I don't see why it should not work, especially under the guidance of capable people like you who can always agree and you see and help us. So I'm not worried at all about the PPP. I think it can be a great opportunity, even in the midst of uh, when the hikes on the charges for telemedicine uh, come in, we can work out something that is uh, easy so that our hmm. local communities can still benefit. Dr. Thank Arthur you. Sesanga, the Director of Medical Services at IMC. Thank you very much. Elana Kembevesi, the Program Manager Right to Health at uh, the Initiative for Social and Economic Rights. Let's talk about the fact that the activation of this uh, tax on uh, data is going to hamper access to technological services or devices that could go a long way in alleviating the physical challenge that we are dealing with right now. Also speak to the fact that maybe government did not learn from the onset of the 
first pandemic. The fact that we actually did tell them technology would be the only way people might be able to receive these services. But then we have a tax on the internet, meaning on data, in fact, meaning the government did not learn anything uh, from the first uh, COVID-19 lockdown. Didn't we learn anything? And is that where we dropped the ball, Elena? I, I, I actually thought Arthur would be the person to shout about this tax. Um, I think, That's why I had to I throw think it to you. All of us, tax, I think it's ridiculous. You know? yes. We say digitalization and we are putting these barriers as well, yes. right? Um, and it's easy to think about the internet tax really affecting the rich because you say most of who are, and we argue and we have said that, we necessarily have mobile phones. But um, I think we're increasingly seeing that internet is very critical. People trade using, um, you know, WhatsApp. People share information using WhatsApp. Even before these guys came up with their digital health thing, some people were reaching their doctors um, through, through instances like WhatsApp, right? And so I think that the barrier of having a high internet cost has ramifications on how uh, we are operating, on how we are also collecting information, for example, Pfizer does use um, some digital tools in terms of our monitoring, and that was very key in our monitoring of violations on the ground uh, during the last pandemic, particularly for health. We did get our community um, health advocates mobile phones and put on, loaded on data for them, so they can be able to just monitor who can get healthcare, who can't, what is happening on the ground. Remember, we're all locked down and we could not move, right? Um, so I think that beyond Thank you very much, Elena Kembabazi, the Program Manager, Right to Health at the Initiative for Social and Economic Rights. We are running out of time. Chris Locolio, you're the direct digital country lead at the UNCD. Uh, F, we would like to know what are some of the strategic bottlenecks that you think uh, we need to overcome if we attribute the capacity of the digital health startups in this country, Uganda? The bottlenecks we have to address. Indeed. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I think that, you know, of course, as uh, several colleagues have pointed out, there are certain um, policy um, bottlenecks that might might stand in the way. Many times, it's really a balance. You know, you do need to raise revenue to serve uh, your your citizens, but of course, the, those policies should also not be punitive. And so, I think that there is a balance that needs to be struck. And so, those are certain areas that uh, warrant conversation. I also think that, indeed, I think our digital literacy levels are still low. We do not have digital literacy incorporated into uh, mainstream uh, curricula. So people finish their primary education, secondary education, and then say, oh, I'm taking a class in computer as if it's another level. Yeah, I mean, this should have been mainstreamed all through. So these are some impediments that I think uh, stand in our way. The other is that, you know, as we, as we think about technology, um, it, many times people think about or, you know, this is for, yeah, I, I didn't really study IT, so I'm not going to venture into that. No, this is, this is now a way of life. And um, there are several things that have changed for, for all of us. Unfortunately, there are those in danger of being left behind. And I think that um, having the right policies in place to encourage uptake and usage is important. I also think that uh, the infrastructure in place um, is important, that access to, to, to networks, to payments as providers, to agents, to the devices that we use, all this is important. And I think we do have to commend initiatives like, you know, now we can get phones assembled locally in order to bring those prices down. These are all initiatives to try and extend that access. So these are some of the impediments. And I think that um, as we address those, we should get closer to, to building real, because we are in a digital era and so the digital economy has to be inclusive. And I think that as we tackle those policy, infrastructure, literacy, and innovation uh, gaps, we should be able to get closer to leveraging technology to deliver better healthcare. Thank you so much. And um...
country lead at the United Nations Capital Development Fund. Let's also bring in uh, Dr. Ofi Tamba from the DRC. Dr. Ofi Tamba, share with us some of the recommendations that African uh, countries can employ in, to be able to ward off or curtail the spread of COVID-19. I'm talking about countries like the DRC, countries like Uganda. What recommendations do you have for us to curtail the spread of the same? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, we should, as DRC and uh, Uganda as, as country, uh, our government, especially our Ministry of Health, I think should have learned from the first wave that we, we, we have. If I have one recommendation is to, we, I think that we should uh, uh, think uh, a bit proactively uh, actively about what can uh, happen, like the next uh, step. And I think that we should also, I would recommend the government also to be uh, bold enough to make some big decision about the way our healthcare system is uh, organized. I think that uh, Chris said, said it uh, earlier, we are in the digital area and we are not going to be back to the, to the, the, the like the COVID has just uh, showed us that we, we, sh we should move forward and we think about some uh, big, uh, some uh, 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 component of our healthcare uh, system. And I'm talking about like uh, 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 digitalization. We have started in some area, especially about collecting data in the DRC, for example, for uh, immunization and uh, so on. But I know that it's not enough. We have to rethink proactively about the next step and think also about our reality. We don't want to copy everything for the Western countries, but we have to think to, we have to try to adapt what is currently in place in our country and make sure that we can uh, implement something that is very relevant to our resources. The third thing I can say is also to use the youth for innovative uh, solution, solution. We just want to, see, we don't want to see only about, uh, to look at what have been developed elsewhere. We all, also want to challenge our own youth, people in, at university, young entrepreneur, entrepreneurs, the startup to develop some tool that we can use in our own context, in our own languages. That, so that we can address some of the uh, big public health issues such as uh, COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Alfi Tamba, a health, public health practitioner from the DRC. Elena Kembavasi, this is a yes or no question because we have largely out, run out of time. Should we have started the food distribution drive as soon as yesterday or should we wait for people to die of hunger instead of COVID-19? Elena. Uh, yes, but they're not going to give food, they're going to give money, which is a fascinating discussion. I think it's better than those who profiteered of giving us substandard food the last time. So I, I do think for sure we need to have uh, social protection, the modalities of how that money gets distributed and making sure people who are vulnerable are actually excluded. Is All right. Thank you very much, Elena Kembabazi, the Program Manager, Right to Health at the Initiative for Social and Economic Rights. We, ordered, we also did have Dr. Arthur Sesanga, the Director of Medical Services at the IMC. Also, Dr. Ofi Tamba, a public health practitioner from the DRC. Thank you very much for having made the time. And finally, Chris Lukolio, the Digital Country Lead at the United Nations Capital Development Fund. The COVID-19 pandemic is still here. Please, strict adherence to the SOPs is the only way we can come out of this debacle. My name is Romy Basiku. Good morning.